Amin Reina here from Sage Investors, and I'm here to do a quick mind map analysis on a stock that I've been kind of looking, had on my radar screen and been looking to, to maybe pick up, which is uh, Tapestry, ticker symbol TPR. Uh, by the way, this video can also be uh, available, is also available in podcast format. You can download it through my website, sageinvestors.ca, or through Apple Podcasts. Um, Tapestry is a stock uh, company that I've had on my radar screen, and I really, you know, as, as a, it's a stock I've owned in the past, and I've just recently gotten a little bit more interested into it because the stock has really been dropping over the last year or so has dropped uh, quite a bit. This is a stock that was trading at about $50 a share uh, earlier in the year and it has gone all the way down to about uh, as low as almost $19 a share. It recently really dropped from about 27 to 19. It's now popped back up a little bit now to about 24, but uh, um, I wanted to take a quick look at it and see maybe if it's a potential um, opportunity to pick up some shares. So. Every time I'm looking at a company, every time I'm analyzing a company and analyzing a stock, I'm always asking myself uh, the same set of questions, same series of questions. And usually after I answer those questions, I have a pretty good idea whether I want to buy the stock or not buy the stock or hold off on it or not even avoid it altogether. So what I'm going to do here is, is uh, as I always do, is just walk through answering these questions and answering them in the context of uh, evaluating tapestry. So tapestry, uh, first question I usually ask is, okay, what does a company do? What do they sell? What is What products and services do they sell? What is their value proposition? What makes this, the company unique compared to other similar companies in, in, in their respective industry? Uh, so tapestry, and if pro- a lot of people maybe don't even know what tapestry is. Tapestry, people know probably know the products that tapestry sells, but they probably don't know because the company uh, a while ago changed their name. Uh, uh, for those of you who are aware of Coach, the Coach purses and everything like that, uh, the Coach stores, uh, the factory outlets, uh, that's Tapestry. That's the company Tapestry. So, But um, the company has uh, really evolved from just purely being a company that just sells um, handbags um, to what I think is essentially, uh, it's become essentially a holding company, uh, holding company of luxury brands. So we've got uh, Coach, which is all the handbags, leather goods. And uh, over the last few years, they've been expand- expanding their portfolio, they've been going out on a bit of a, um, a buying uh, binge and have been acquiring other types of luxury brands, specifically uh, Kate Spade and uh, Stuart Weissman, they make uh, the shoe company. So they're very much uh, uh, a luxury brand. So when you think of Tapestry, you think of Coach, Kate Spade, Stuart Weissman, luxury brands, almost in the same way as you would model uh, Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton is actually, is is a similar way uh, uh, a, a conglomerate of all kinds of luxury brands. Um, and I guess I, I might as well just feed into the next question is, uh, who do they sell? Like, who are, their, who are their main competitors? Are there any competitors? So as I just said, um, some of the more prominent com- competitors in the luxury retail space would be companies like um, Tiffany, um, Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton, and uh, Michael Kors. So the concept that they're selling, and it goes back to the value proposition, is sort of this exclusivity. When you think of it, uh, luxury brands, exclusivity, high quality, and obviously that carries a, a higher uh, price point. Um, who would buy stuff from a tapestry-related company? Who would buy stuff from Coach or Kate Spade or Stuart Weissman. And that leads to the next question is, who are the customers? And uh, typically the customers have been um, people in upper middle, upper middle income, upper to middle income, the whole aspirational um, 
um, demographic, um, projecting a higher status of living. You know, it's all about, all about you know, projecting status. Um, their customers also have been strictly, and this is going back to the coach days when it was exclusively coach, uh, was had a very North American, um, traditionally it was very, uh, North American focus. They had their, they were pretty much just only in North America, but now they've been going really much more expanding into more other areas, uh, specifically China. They've got, made a real big push into China, uh, and, and also of course Europe, uh, one of the things I'm also interested in is with the customer, with people who buy stuff from um, Tapestry is oh, great that people are going out and buying um, handbags and shoes and belts. Um, are these type of people coming back? Is this sort of a one-off transaction or do they sell products uh, that will invite people to buy things over and over again? And I think one of the things that's kind of uh, bitten Tapestry slash Coach uh, in the butt has been... Um, a little bit of in terms of dilution of brand, and I think uh, I remember you know, the coach when I remember it was you used to find lineups uh, if you go to like outlet malls or even you just go to a regular full fledged coach store. There used to be lineups to get into this place. It was just insane how incredibly popular it was, um, and so there was a lot of lot of uh, brand loyalty toward the customer uh, toward the coach brand. I think what has happened, and we'll get into, I'll talk a little bit about this when we get into the risks, and maybe I'll just, I'll just uh, draw it out here, is uh, brand dilution. I think what happened over the last five, ten, five, seven years has been, there's been a dilution in the brand of Coach, and I think a lot of it has to do with selling. Um, they went really hardcore into the whole outlet mall, factory outlet um, distribution channel, and I think really saturated the market too much with their products and I think that had uh, it kind of tarnished a little bit of the exclusivity and the uh, the brand itself and I think that has really led to the company kind of going in a downward trajectory over the last uh, many years um, and well I'll talk a little bit more about that but in terms of uh, but what I've noticed and I think this is part of the thing that maybe piqued my interest with 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 tapestry is I was recently, I've been in a few malls uh, the last while, and I noticed, I was quite surprised to see how those lineups that I used to remember like five, ten years ago, they seem to be back. And there are people lining up to get into coach stores or people lining up to get into Kate Spade stores. And I was like, whoa, why is this happening? This is new. And I think the company might be kind of in the midst of now getting into a good turnaround mode. And I'll get into it in terms of when I get into risk. But customers, traditionally people that are aspiring to a higher level status, upper middle income, um, traditionally North America, but now they are trying to become a much more global um, conglomerate in terms of getting their, getting their, their brands out uh, globally. So... Interesting space, interesting company, but at the end of the day, as investors, we need to know, are these com is this company making money? So that leads to the next question that I always ask, okay, is this, is this company profitable? Is this company generating tangible returns on invested capital? Is this company gen generating solid, consistent economic profit? Uh, so usually when I'm trying to evaluate the financial performance of a company, my go-to metric has been economic profit, which is taking a look at a company's return on invested capital and comparing it to the company's cost of capital. And so companies that generate high returns on invested capital compared to their cost of capital are generating positive economic profit. And from my experience and from my analysis work looking at stocks, uh, the stock market tends to put premiums on stocks, on companies that have that ability to generate positive economic profit. So I'm always on the lookout for companies that can create tangible wealth for their shareholders. And so when I looked at um, Coach, or I, I, I call him Coach, even though it's Tapestry, I'm going to call him Coach. When I look at Coach, uh, the returns on invested capital over the last couple of years have ranged between 24 and 32%, which is extremely high and extremely solid and when you compare it to the company's cost of capital which comes in between nine and ten percent this is a company that's creating um, positive economic profit uh, 
And so that's a good thing. As investors, we want to see that. So it's interesting that this company, even though the stock's been kind of sliding downward, um, even though the stock's been sliding downward, um, the company continues to generate consistent levels of economic profit. So those are two things I like to see as investors because maybe potentially there's an opportunity to pick up the stock at a lower price point and get some um, value on, on the rebound uh, for, this, for the company. So that's a good thing. And so that leads to the next question that I will ask, I usually ask is how strong is the company financially? What is their financial position? And oftentimes to figure out what the company's financial strength is and how strong a company is financially, we need to take a quick look at the company's balance sheet. So when I'm looking at a company's balance sheet, there's usually three areas I'm, I'm interested in that I'm gonna just do a quick look at. One is I wanna have a comfort level with the company's liquidity position i.e. does the company have more than enough cash on hand to cover their short-term day-to-day op uh, operational obligations. So when I look at uh, Tapestry, their current ratio is about, which is the ratio of current assets to current liabilities, is about three times. They have three times the amount of cash versus current liabilities. They have about 1.5 billion in cash on, the, on hand. Uh, when you look at the company's debt, uh, they actually have about 1.6 billion in debt. So the company seems to have more than enough cash on hand to meet their short-term and long-term obligations. So that's a sign of, of a company that's financially strong. Um, drilling down into the debt level, the company's debt to equity, which is another metric I look at to understand how much debt is the company is incurring, comes in at about 0.45%. Um, traditionally, this is actually... Uh, Coach and now Tapestry have had very low levels of debt, um, and it's made it a very interesting company uh, in terms of a potential takeover candidate uh, historically. But now their debt levels have gone up high, partly because they've gone out and been buying brands, specifically Stuart Weissman and Kate Spade. They incurred a lot of debt to finance those um, those purchases. Um, the third area, and because of that, when you look at their balance sheet, their 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 quality of their financial assets, the quality of their assets now uh, has skewed now more to intangible. So um, when I look at the company's quality of assets, i.e., the amount of goodwill or intangible assets um, for uh, Tapestry, it's historically it was like nothing, and now it's at about forty to forty-five percent. And a lot of it is because of the purchases of Stuart Weissman and Kate Spade um, added to the goodwill side of their uh, balance sheet. So liquidity-wise, the company seems to be pretty strong. The debt level is probably a little bit high now. Um, and the quality of assets is not, you know, it's ideally I like to buy stocks where of companies where there are their intangible assets are at the most 20%. So this is a little bit a little bit high for, for my liking. But anyway, let's keep going. Let's see what else we can uh, find out with that. Um, the next question that I'll ask then is, what are the risks associated with this company? What could What is out there that could take this company down um, from a social, economic, whatever, uh, consumer behavior, whatever type of uh, perspective. So one risk that the company has faced, and the company I think is a big reason why the stock has been on a downward trend, is this whole dilution of their brand. I think the company over the last 10 years um, went really heavy into the whole discounted uh, outlet mall kind of model of distribution. And I think they what they happened was they conditioned people to pay lower prices and not make people more willing to pay full price for their high quality articles, high quality products. Um, I think uh, that has been, an, I think, an issue with, with the stock. Um, and I think from what I understand now, I think the company has come to grips with this, has come to this realization in the sense that, you know what, this is not the way to go. And so what they've been actually doing is they've been um, trying to walk it back in the sense now, uh, from what I understand, they've been closing more stores, closing more outlet malls, and now um, containing more, uh, more full price, full cost uh, retail um, outlets. 
and they're also doing less discounting, um, trying to recondition people to pay more full to pay full price for their goods and services for their goods. And that's usually one of the pitfalls for luxury retailers is that risk of diluting their brand. And I think what's happened with, especially with Coach, is I think they weren't very um, the governance or the they weren't very guarding of their brand. They kind of let it go. And the problem a lot of times is when a when a luxury brand kind of lets their go, uh, kind of goes downstream with their with their brand, it's very hard to get it back up to that exclusivity factor. And I think this is something that's really dogged the company over the last 10 years, but it appears to be that the company now, the management and the table that's running it now is trying to walk it back and trying to bring back that exclusivity factor. And it's been engaged in a process of, of uh, igniting the brand. And I think part of it by acquiring companies like Kate Spade and Stuart Weissman is again to and build up that um, that brand exclusivity factor and, and kind of taking away the coach um, title of the company and going to a more, you know, I guess generic kind of company name and tapestry, I think is part of this whole branding, rebranding, re-exclusivity exclusivity, um, strategy that they're t- trying to do. Um, other risks, well, there's, there's always, you know, the, the gorilla in the room always is the economic side of it. Um, this is a consumer discretionary product that they're selling. So if the economy were to tank, um, that's going to impact consumer spending and could potentially impact the ability for people to buy stuff from, from tapestry. Um, luxury retail is a very cyclical is business right now. Is a, has always been a very cyclical um, industry. Um, so there are always that risk of, of going into down cycles. Um, the other risk also is, you know, the whole China factor. As I said, the company is now has been aggressively moving into the China market. If the trade uh, trash talking if the trade trash talking continues to persist, um, American brands in China could come under a lot of local pressure. Um, from the Chinese government and just consumers might just get turned off by American brands and that could have a negative impact on, on, on tapestry. So that's that risk that's out there. And I think that's also part of the reason why the stock has been, has been, uh, has been uh, taking a, a bit of a hit from this side of it. So at the end of the day, it seems like you know luxury retail brand generating tangible wealth Decent financial position. It seems to be more cognizant of the risks in terms of preserving its brand and maintaining its brand identity. Um, and the stock's trading at a, as struck, stock has gone down from 50 to almost 19 to $24. The final question we need to ask, everything looks interesting, but at the end of the day, we're investors and we want to buy shares at a good price. We want to have good entry points. Uh, we want to buy stocks where there's potential for upside. So that leads to the final question which is, is a stock cheap? Just because a company may be really awesome and sell really cool products doesn't mean the stock is cheap and worth investing in. So we gotta look at some of the valuation um, components to it. Uh, from what I found, uh, from a relative perspective, if you were to compare the company to other luxury retailers out there, and a company has a forward PE of about P multiple of between 10 to 12, 10 to 12 times earnings. Um, if you were to compare the industry or the median luxury retailer, they're trading at about 18 times. So from that perspective, the stock looks cheap, quite cheap on a relative valuation. Um, from discounted cash flow models that I've seen out there, the stock's intrinsic value seems to come in between $33 and $41 a share. Again, the stock's trading at about 19 to 24 right now. So again, from that perspective, the stock looks pretty cheap on a, on a discounted cash flow perspective. Um, so at the end of the day, when I'm looking at this company, I'm seeing this is a company, you know, luxury retail. It's trying to build a portfolio of luxury brands. Luxury brands tend to be high margin that generate really higher returns on invested capital, which is what we want to see as investors. Um, it seems to have a pretty decent financial position. The stock is incredibly cheap, especially now since it's dropped from 15 to now in the 20s. Um, but it has risks. 
And I think one of the reasons why the stock has been falling has been, I think, a lot of the brand dilution issues that the company has been facing over the last decade. The company seems to be in the process of turning that around, rebuilding that exclusivity factor, that exclusivity value proposition. And also um, the fact that the, the, the China trash talking, trade trash talking, tariff trash talking is out there. And I think it's been a putting a drag on companies that are doing business in China. And so when I put these two factors in, I think that has contributed to the fact that the stock has dropped to where it is. So I'm looking at it as an investor and I'm going, hey, this is a company that's creating tangible wealth, decent financial position. It's taking a definite strategy to walk its brand back up to a certain level of exclusivity and it's cheap. So when I looked at these factors, I thought, I think these are all the ingredients are there to, uh, to, to, to pick up the stock. And so uh, ultimately, I think when I'm looking at this company, I think this is a, a real good buying uh, a buy for me. Now, in terms of price points, uh, when I f- first started to look at it, the stock was trading at about 19. And then only in the last like few weeks, the stock's actually about, popped up to about 24, which I thought was a little bit too pricey. So right now, I'm kind of holding off buying the shares right now, but I've got it on my watch list. And if the market were to turn around on uh, on any kind of uh, correction or something, if there's some shock that happens to the market and the stock were to walk back to maybe the low 20s or like even got under 20, I would probably, you know, um, I would probably jump in and uh, start building a position on it. So there you go. That's my uh, quick analysis on the shares of Tapestry. Um, as I said, this video is also available in podcast format. You can download it through my website, sageinvestors.ca, or through Apple Podcasts. Subscribe. You can subscribe to all my uh, podcasts, uh, my Stock Talk post- podcasts, through Apple Podcasts. So subscribe, leave a comment, leave a review. That'd be great. If you have any more questions about uh any other uh, companies that I've analyzed, as well as my, as I said, I teach also people how to make investment decisions. I teach people how to invest in stocks and ETFs. So if you are interested in my online or live classroom courses, you can check me out on my website, sageinvestors.ca. So this has been uh, another mind map video, this time looking at tapestry. My name is Amin Reina. I'm an investment coach at Sage Investors. And thanks for listening in. Thanks for watching in. We'll catch you again another time. Take care. Bye-bye.